Uh, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask you. If you were going on a camping trip in the wilderness, would you take a tent with you? Yes. 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 You'd take a tent, probably a sleeping bag, other equipment, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you wouldn't want to be up in the wilderness, like the Adirondack Mountains, someplace like that, without a tent, because you may not survive without it. If you were going um, to play a game of football, and it was going to be a game of tackle football, besides a football, would you want to have other equipment? Yeah. Yeah. A uniform with like pads and so forth? If you're thinking no, I'd highly recommend that you change your thinking on that. Um, I, when I was in high school, thought that was not necessary, and then I went from that football game to the emergency room to get my jaw wired. So I found out that that was important. It was important to have the right equipment for that game, or you might end up with a broken jaw. Mike, you're, you work on houses. If you were going to repair somebody's house, would you want to have your tools with you? Yes, you would. That would be important. If you showed up without your tools, there's not a lot that you could do. Jerry, you were in Vietnam. When soldiers went into combat, did they have a weapon with them? Oh, yeah. Yes, they did. And I would dare say that None of us would want to go into battle without a weapon, would you? No. no. Now, all of those questions are to make the point of how important it is to have the right equipment, the right whatever's needed for whatever we're doing. And the last one that I talked about there was going into battle. And whether or not people realize it, I trust that you know it. We are in a battle. It is, though, a spiritual battle. And you can take your Bibles and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where we're going to learn about what we would like to have, what we need to have for this battle that we are in. Because for the spiritual battle that we're in, it isn't a gun that we need. It isn't bow and arrow that we need or a sword that we need and not a, a physical sword. Instead, we need some other kind of weapons. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3, we read, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The weapons. We have to have weapons for this warfare. And the warfare, the battle that we're in, is not a five senses one. It's not a flesh battle. It's not a battle of people shooting at each other, although that, you know, could happen. But that's not primarily the battle that we're involved in, and that's not what it's describing here. It's not describing that kind of battle, but rather a spiritual one. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical, but rather spiritual. We are in a spiritual battle, and we need the weapons in order to fight that kind of battle. And just as important, no, even more important than having the weapon that you would need for a physical battle it's important to have the weapon that you need to be able to fight in the spiritual battle that you're in. And it says that those weapons are mighty to God to the pulling down of strongholds. The pulling down of strongholds. You know, when you picture a stronghold, what do you see? Maybe a big castle, you know? This big stronghold, there's this you know, huge fortress that's been strengthened against the attack of the enemy, and it's tall, and it's big, and it's strong. Well, the weapons that we have are mighty to pulling down those spiritual strongholds. Those spiritual strongholds. And what that means for our lives is those areas in life where 
our adversary has really gotten a stronghold in our lives. The battlefield, you'll see as we go on, is not a physical battlefield, just as it's not a physical battle. The battlefield is the mind. That's where this war, this battle is waged. It's in the mind. It's in the mind. And for each person, there can be those areas where the adversary just has a stronghold. One of those areas in life that you just have a hard time getting on top of, where the adversary somehow seems to beat you. Maybe it's a fear that you have a hard time overcoming. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's some sickness that you have a hard time getting healed from. Whatever the case may be, there can be those areas in life that are strongholds. But we can still overcome because we have the necessary weapons. If it was a big castle, you know, I've seen those movies, what do they always bring in? Battering, battering rams. Battering rams. Somebody else has watched those movies. You've got the battering rams. You know, and they do all kinds of things, but at some point they're like getting, you know, a bunch of guys or horses or something, and they're coming and they're like taking this huge battering ram and they <coughs> bang it down to get in. Or maybe they beat that stronghold with cannons and they're shooting at later dates cannons at those walls until they weaken them and they break through. Our weapons are spiritual. And here, verse 5, we get a good idea of what those weapons are and how they work. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <clears throat> Anybody have written in their Bible the literal translation that was done of that in, in the Renewed Mind class? I do. You do? Good. Go ahead and read it, would you? Okay. Let me get this. <laughs> yeah. I wrote smaller. <laughs> yeah, back then, didn't we all? <laughs> Demolish your human logic from the high position to which you have lifted it vertically against the knowledge of God, which you have known by experience. Be wise. Lead captive everything to Christ, which you have attentively listened to and heard. Okay, good. I, I, I knew it all but about two words that I forgot <laughs> there. Um, it is that process, that process of tearing down our own human logic that would be against or opposed to God's Word. Those things in life that maybe it is some fear that you have, and it's that, that thinking that causes that fear to stay there. And we're to tear those things down and instead lead every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Lead, how many thoughts? Every, every, every thought. thought. Every thought. There's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. And boy, you've got to recognize that every minute in life you are in that battle. If you are in a physical battle, and you're out on patrol, you would not forget that there was an enemy out there. If you did, you could be in big trouble real quick, right? Mm -hmm. You'd be aware because you know the stakes, and so you're, you're vigilant, you're watchful, and you're always on guard, and you're on guard watching for the attack. And boy, if the enemy does attack, then you use your weapon against him, right? Yes. yes. So it is with this battle that we're in. Every minute, we have to be on guard. We have to be vigilant. We have to be vigilant against the endless suggestions of our adversary. And who is our adversary? The devil. The devil. That's what it says. It says in Peter, 1 Peter, I think, chapter 5, yep. that our adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking, seeking whom he may devour. Boy, if you were out in the jungle... And you, there was a lion. Did you ever see that movie, Ghost in the Darkness? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Boy, if you, if you want a good mind picture of what I'm talking about, it's an old movie. It's like about t probably 20 years old now or something like that. But it's about these two lions. That was the names of them in Africa that, that took to liken the taste of people. And, you know, <laughs> you see that movie and, you, you know, you'll, you look at lions a different way after that, I'll tell you. Those guys... In that situation, in the jungle, they were very aware when they were walking out there, especially in the, at night, that they had this adversary, a lion, waiting to devour them. But boy, that's the case for us. But our adversary is not a physical lion, it's the devil. And he tries to devour us. He wants nothing more than to steal, to kill, and to destroy he wants to rip you off. He wants to steal the word away from you. He wants to steal God's abundance away from you. He wants to, to kill you. Mm. He can't destroy you once you're born again. But for those that aren't, that's what he'd like to do. And we're aware. And we're aware that the way he tries to get at us is with his endless suggestions, thoughts. It's not that the devil comes to you, you know, personally and confronts you like he did Jesus Christ. And it's not like, you know, there's this, like in the cartoons, this little, you know, red devil over here and this little angel on this shoulder. I should have done it vice versa. Um, whispering in your ear. The devil works in his influence, has the God of this world. And in that capacity, biblically, the term that's used is Satan. When you see the word Satan used, that word is used to describe the devil as he works through the world, and he's the God of this world. And so he works by all the negatives and all the situations to try to get at you, to try to put fear in you. Maybe you hear of something really alarming on the news. There was something very alarming recently on the news that everybody you know, is very concerned about, and, and that can put fear in you. That can cause you to be afraid. Oh my gosh, what a world we live in. You never know what might happen. You're not safe anywhere. And you let that thought linger there, and pretty soon what happens? You believe it. But what are we to do with a thought like that? Lead a captive. Lead a captive to the obedience of Christ. And immediately replace it with the promises of God's word. And boy, that's our weapon. That's our weapon. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Here in Ephesians 6, we won't read the whole section. Well, maybe I should. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, we'll start it off in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in whom? The Lord. the Lord. Can we be strong in the Lord? Is he worthy to be strong in? Does he have some power? Does he have some might? Is he, is he stronger, greater than Satan, the God of this world? Yes. 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 That's the promise. It says that, where is it? In 1 John 4, 4. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that's in you, that strength of God and Christ in you. Put on the whole armor, verse 11, of God, that you may be, may be able to stand against the wiles, the methods of the devil. We're to put on this whole armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It is that spiritual fight. It might look at times like it is of wrestling against flesh and blood, that it's this person, that it's this evil person over here, or that it's, it's this person that's just bugging you, that's just annoying you or harassing you in some way. But that's never the case. It's always a spiritual fight. That you're just looking at, at the actors on the stage, you're not reading the script. You're not seeing what's going on, what the real story is. If you only see that far, if you only see that person 
who is rude to you or mean to you or does something, then you're not seeing deep enough. You need to put on your spiritual vision. You need to see that this is not, that's just, that's just the, the, the actors. Who's pulling the strings is the adversary. And the way that you fight it isn't by trying to deal with the actor, it's by dealing with the one that's pulling the strings, the adversary. To do that, we put on that whole armor, verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to do what? Stand. Stand. Stand, Stand your ground. Get your feet planted. Drive your stake into the ground. Stand. Stand. You know? Mm. All these great illustrations that come to my mind. I get more illustrations than I have time to share. But I'm thinking about that Battle of Gettysburg where you had that, I don't know, what was he, a clergyman, a school teacher, something from Maine, up in Maine. And anybody know the Battle of Gettysburg well enough to know this? Well, it's a great record. This guy, he's, he's in charge, and he's told he's got to hold this line, that if the enemy breaks through there, and then the south, he's a northerner, obviously, Maine, and if the enemy breaks through, they're lost. And he's got a small group of guys, and there's a huge, huge group coming at him. And he repels, like, attack after attack. And finally, they tell him, we don't have enough ammunition for another attack. You know what he does? He tells them to charge the enemy with their bayonets. So they go running it, and this over this huge army that's you know, much greater than his force, they, they run. They go running. <laughs> they go running. Because this guy is just whatever it takes, he's going to stand. He's going to stand. Boy, that's got to be our attitude, that no matter what, we stand. Stand, therefore, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of believing, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. God. Every one of those things listed that I just read through quickly are very important. And we could spend easily the full half hour here just looking at this section. But it's the offensive weapon that I want to focus on here this evening, the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Always carry your sword. Don't go out unarmed. You wouldn't go out into battle without a weapon. Don't go out into this world without your sword in your hand, the Word of God. And I don't mean just carrying it around the Bible in your hand. It's more important what you carry in your heart. Great to carry the Bible in your hand. If you saw the movie, the, here, another one of those illustrations. If you saw the movie, The Book of Eli... You know, there's this big conclusion at the end. If you haven't seen it, I won't give everything away. But you know, the message of that movie isn't the debate of whether or not the guy was blind. The message of the movie is if the Word of God's going to live, it's got to live within us. It has to live within us. It's the Word of God that you have in your heart, the Word of God that you know, the Word of God that you have memorized. Because it's hard to quote the Word of God if you don't know the Word of God, isn't it? And it's the Word of God that is our weapon. And it's not enough to just have some kind of nice religious platitudes or some poetic verse. It's not enough to have some, you know, Roy Lesson greeting card stuff in your head. Not to pick on him. Nice that he writes nice greeting cards. But it's the Word of God itself. It's Scripture. That's what we fight with. It's Scripture. Look at Matthew chapter 4. It's what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ used. He didn't just have some, you know, kind of general ideas when he was confronted with the adversary. And he was confronted head on, directly by the devil. 
in Matthew chapter 4. In verse 1 it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, this is what the tempter, the adversary, the devil says to him, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. You're hungry. You're hungry. And you know, you haven't eaten in a long time here. And you know what you can do? You can just command those stones to be made bread. If you're the Son of God, do it. And what does Jesus Christ do? Does he say, well, I'm not that hungry, or no, I know that you're just trying to get me here, and I'm not going to fall. It is written. It is written. Verse 4. But he answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is written. And then he quotes the scripture. And what a great scripture he quotes for us to remember. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word out of the mouth of God that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's got to be our weapon, the scripture. These words are spirit and they are life. And he's tempted four times. We won't look at the whole section here, but each time, each time that is his reply. It is written. It is written. I have here just a couple of my many different collections of scripture retemory cards, we call them. Um, this one is the one that a lot of people are familiar with. We call the white cards, scripture retemory, and there's 25 of these. Um, the first one, Psalm 119, 11. Thy word have I hidden mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. And I have these along, these are my way course scripture retemories, and they're dealing with the adversary, scripture retemories from that class, and there's other ones that we've had in different classes over the years or that have been uh, distributed at different events. One of the advances in New Jersey, they've passed out some. And that's all great, and you can make up your own. You can make up your own scripture retemories. You can write them down. On just You don't need to do it fancy if you don't want to. You can just write them on little pieces of paper. Or you can be like me, and you get, you know, in your computer, you get one of those um, business card, blank business card things that go in your printer, and then you go to Microsoft Word, and you get a template for business cards, and you format them. And, and you have these scriptures that you then take, carry around with you. So you carry it in your pocket, and then you just take out a few at a time. Maybe you work on maybe five at a time is a good number to work on. And you just keep on working on them. Whenever you got a free moment, instead of being annoyed that you have to wait in a line, pull out your scripture retemories and, and work on them. You got some extra time, you're waiting for the dentist, you know, take it. All throughout your day, whenever you've got a few minutes to spare, you just work on these retemories. And memorizing these scriptures. So then you've got them to fight with. Talking about making up your own. I've got some that I made up here as a gift for somebody in this room. You've heard of serving the word on a silver platter. Well, I'm serving it in a silver case. And this is a little gift to you, Alan. Jerry, would you hand that over to him? Thank you. You're welcome. And I put it in a silver case because we serve the Word of God in a, on a silver platter because it's deserving of it. That the Word of God is just above everything else. And that our attitude toward it should always be that. It should always be this is God's Word. This is special. And we hide it in our heart so that we've got something to fight with. What is it that, what stronghold would you like to overcome in your life? Mm. What area would you like to see change? Is there any promise of God that you haven't claimed yet that you would still like to? Then go to God's Word. Find those verses that relate. Find the promise of God that 
applies to your need, to your situation. And write them down. Memorize them. Have those scriptures. I've used scripture retemories. I've used the scriptures, the, the, the word of God that I've hid in my heart. Not just in situations like that, but if I have a specific thing that I'm trying to do, then I'll, I'll find verses. Like, for example, <clears throat> at times when I've been out looking for a job, every time I put in an application, and I don't know if there's ever been a time <clears throat> in my life where jobs were in abundance. If so, I wasn't looking for one at that time, because any time that I was out looking, Everybody was telling me, oh, there's no, nobody's hiring. There's no jobs. Oh, we've got an economic whatever. And every time I'd go in when I was looking for a job and I'd ask, are you hiring? They'd say, oh, no. And the minute I walked out, as soon as I got my foot out the door, I'd quote a couple of verses to myself. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. Or 2 Corinthians 9.8. <clears throat> I'd quote these verses of Scripture. I'd quote them so that, again, that negative wouldn't have a chance to begin to affect my thinking. The negative, the negative. Again, it's endless suggestions. It's not the adversary coming at you directly and saying, you know, I'll give you all these kingdoms of the world if you'll bow down and worship me. But rather, it's him trying to keep us living below par trying to keep us from enjoying the abundance that God's promised us, trying to keep us from walking with the power of God that is ours. We have great power. We have these great spiritual abilities. But in order for us to manifest them, for in order for us to walk with the power of God, we have to first wage that battle in the mind. Mm. If we're going to walk with the power of God and do signs, miracles, and wonders like God's Word tells us we can do, if we're going to enjoy the perfect health that is ours according to the promises of Christ Jesus and what God accomplished in Christ, if we're going to enjoy the prosperity that is ours, then we have to believe it. And in order to do that, we drive God's Word in our mind and we lead every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Well, one other place I'd like you to go, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I bet you there's a lot of people in this room that can quote this one. Verse 16 All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. If you can quote it, you can do it with me and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, keep going, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So there we've got the profit and the purpose of God's word. It's so that we can be perfect, so that we can be always fully equipped for every situation. God's word does it. God's Word is what gives us that instruction. And it works for us as we work it and believe it. God bless you.